Hello everyone, welcome back. I am Be Better Gamer, and this is episode number two of my WCW NWO Revenge Let's Play series. Hopped into options real quick so that you can see I'm playing it on hard. I should have turned off the music. I, I keep forgetting to turn off the music. I don't like playing with the music on, so in the next video I'll turn off the music, but there's the current World Heavyweight Champion, Hollywood Hulk Hogan, and um, in celebration of this year's WWE Hall of Fame 2015 class, I'm going to be doing a World Heavyweight title run with Macho Man Randy Savage. I'm jumping into the costume edit real quick because I wanted to play, you know, with Macho Man's colorful tights. Um, but unfortunately they don't have his face without the sunglasses and I really don't like that they included the sunglasses for certain wrestlers in this game <laughs> um, when you first get the game like Hogan has his sunglasses Scott Steiner has his sunglasses Macho Man has his sunglasses is like no one wrestles with sunglasses on I can understand it being a feature when you enter the ring and that's something you could later add on in WWF WrestleMania 2000 and No Mercy. You can have sunglasses um, when you enter but not like during the whole match. It's just silly. I've never seen a wrestler during his whole match have a pair of sunglasses on. I mean that would kind of be you know funny in a way. But um, yeah, I'm gonna do the WCW World Heavyweight Championship run with Watcher Man, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Huge fan of Macho Man growing up. You know, classic WWF Macho Man. Probably my favorite um, Macho Man, if you will, because his, his WCW when he went to WCW, he he wasn't the same in my opinion. They didn't use him you know as well as he was used in WWF a lot more memorable matches in WWF but he did have some notable runs in WCW and I'm gonna talk about all of that I'm gonna talk about a lot of his you know matches in WCW his uh, four times as the WCW World Heavyweight Champion his relationship with guys like Kevin Nash who I'm facing right now and this match actually this is gonna be a long match, uh, and I'm gonna get to that in a bit. But real quick, let me—I'm you know, really bad at this. Uh, you know, kind of like the introduction of these videos and who I am, or whatever. I have to be better about it, but whatever. Uh, here's my attempt at doing it again, like three minutes into the recording. I am be better gamer. Uh, if you're if, if this is your first time watching the video, thank you, welcome uh, for my let's play videos. I, I am doing, you know, I'm focusing on the AKI developed wrestling games. That's, you know, WCW NW Revenge, World Tour, WrestleMania 2000, WWF No Mercy, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2. Um, I have a few WWF No Mercy championship videos up. Please go watch those if you enjoy this video. I have a few Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 videos that I just put up. And this is my second WCW NW Revenge. Uh, let's play. I have a few playthroughs already of WCW NW Revenge, but they don't have commentary on them. So I'm doing commentary now, and I'm gonna try to focus on wrestlers that I haven't done playthrough of already. But you know, I kind of want to do another Rey Mysterio run and an Ultimo Dragon run, so I'll probably just I'll probably just break my own rule anyway, which I always do. I always create rules for myself and end up breaking them. I'm playing as Macho Man, A, because he's my favorite wrestler, one of my favorite wrestlers, not, you know, I, I don't just have one singular favorite wrestler, although he would probably, he would probably be in that conversation if I had to decide one. And I'm also playing as him, you know, because the first video I did was Sting, and Sting's gonna be at WrestleMania, he's gonna be wrestling at WrestleMania, and then I was looking at, well, who should I do next? And right away I was like, let me do Macho Man. He's inducted finally in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, I wanted to pay tribute to him in some way. My own little way because this is a wrestler that had a huge impact on me being a fan of wrestling. Um, as a kid, you know, I, I was into Hulk Hogan. I'm, I'm, I'm 28, so I was born in 1986. So my memories of wrestling stretch back to like, you know, when I was four or five. Okay, so you're thinking 1990, 1991. And Macho Man and Hulk Hogan at the time were like the two top stars in the WWF. Uh, I vividly remember the WrestleMania where they fought. 
I don't think I saw it live. I might have seen a taping of it. But I vividly remember the WrestleMania, you know, five between Hogan and Macho Man, you know, the clash of the mega powers. Uh, and a lot of the WrestleManias after that. Eventually, guys like Bret Hart would become, you know, one of my favorites as well. Uh, but, yeah, Macho Man Randy Savage, he was the one I gravitated towards. He was the one that I would do impressions of at school when we, when we were all playing wrestling. <laughs> when we were all, you know, play fighting and wrestling each other and mimicking. I was mimicking Macho Man. I was doing the flying elbow drop. Uh, I was rooting for Macho Man when he lost to Ultimate Warrior with his career, you know, quote-unquote career on the line. Um, and when he went to WCW, when he, he and Hogan went to WCW, that's when I really started watching WCW a lot more. I mean, I was I mentioned in my Sting video that I was exposed to WCW at an early age, but I didn't really follow it until Hogan and Macho Man went over there. Um, but my friend who also watched wrestling was more familiar with the WCW product So he introduced me to guys like Sting and Vader and all those people Beforehand, but it wasn't until Macho Man and Hogan started going over there and teaming up and You know, I was I was right in the thick of it when the NWO came you had Hall and Nash come and Macho Man was part of the team team WCW to defend WCW against the the outsiders and it's you know it's very fitting that the first match starts with Kevin Nash or uh, you know cuz Kevin Nash was the outsider and Macho Man was the team WCW him Sting and Luger and then Hogan would come down and you think Hogan's going to save the day and he ends up giving the leg drop to Macho Man and I was shocked I was shocked as a kid I was like what's going on and in my mind I'm thinking man Hogan betrayed Macho Man <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like this is a this is a flip. This is a flip. Oh man, I went for the flying elbow right there and I missed it. So I go for the flying elbow a lot in this run because it's so hard to win with it. Just because A, you got to keep the opponent down long enough. B, um, Macho Man doesn't run too fast to the, to the corner. So it takes a little bit. And C, again, the AI in this game is a little bit broken. I, I talked about it in the first episode. So they don't like to stay down too long after you hit them with the elbow drop. Also, your meter has to be significantly higher than theirs, even if you do hit them with the elbow drop. Because in this game, with the computer's meter means a lot on how you're going to you know pull off a pin. You know, right now we're both at greens. If I go for a pin right now, they're gonna kick out. You know, regardless, regardless of how much damage I've been doing, and you'll see it throughout this run. See, like right there, I can nail an elbow drop to the outside. You know, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen Macho Man do an elbow drop to the outside, but you know, maybe in his younger days he did. Um, but yeah, I think it's very fitting that I have this match with with, with Nash because uh, you know that's when the NWO started. You had the Outsiders. Macho Man was in the thick of that. But as a kid, I was thinking, man, Hulk Hogan just betrayed Macho Man. Because I, I'm remembering back in WrestleMania, you know, 5, when the Mega Powers exploded, it was, it was Macho Man who turned on Hogan. It was Macho Man who was jealous of Hulk Hogan and, you know, the whole, you know, if, if, you, if you're number one, I'm number three. <laughs> you know, I love that. I love that promo. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of aggressive these days if you watch that promo because like he pushes Miss Elizabeth and it's like so real. And if you know a lot about Macho Man's personal life, you know his relationship with Miss Elizabeth. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad controversy around that. You know, he was abusive. Uh, I don't know how physically abusive he was. There's rumors that he was, but he definitely was like mentally abusive to her and very overprotective kept her very sheltered even in like dynamite kids book he talks about how like macho man would like keep her locked in the hotel room because he didn't want her associating with any of the other guys uh he was you know he was afraid they would try to like you know steal her from him but you know he was very controlling and the whole the whole macho man paranoia act wasn't too much of an act i mean the dude apparently was really paranoid and just had a lot of a lot of unfortunate you know behavior issues that you know just it's just it's just the kind of thing it's like I mean we're all not we're not perfect right I'm just gonna say it right now I love Macho Man okay the wrestler the wrestler Macho Man I love I hit the promos he did the matches he put on 
Macho Man the wrestler I love. Macho Man the real guy doesn't sound too nice of a person. And I probably wouldn't want to have been friends with him um, based off of some of the things I knew he did. But at the same time, you hear about the wrestlers that were friends with him and he did have a good side to him. So, you know, who am I to judge? Um, I, I'm not condoning what he did and saying what he did was good when it came to his relationship with his wife. But, you know, that's... I wasn't there. I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and wag my finger and say, oh, you know, he was a horrible human being, 100%. We all do bad things. We all do good things. And we don't always know the full story, especially if we don't know the person personally. So when I talk about guys like Macho Man, you know, and there's other wrestlers that fall into those categories, even like guys like Ric Flair, you hear about stuff they did and it's like, eh, you know, Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, Chris Benoit, you know, so many guys. And it, it's tough because you watch these guys, you watch these guys perform on screen and you idolize them and then you get a little bit older and you're like, oh, he used to do that to Miss Elizabeth. Oh, that's not cool. So I try to just focus on when I do these videos, I try to just focus on the wrestlers. And I do think Macho Man should be in the Hall of Fame because of his impact on wrestling. Um, it's unfortunate he does have that cloud around him in his personal life. But honestly, every professional wrestler, you know, <laughs> has a cloud on their personal life. Wrestling is a messed up business. I'm sure Daniel Bryan's probably got some skeletons in his closet. Like, it's just, it just comes with, you know, and that's saying that, uh, I mean... It may sound very jaded, and I don't want to talk too much about this because I don't want this episode to be a downer. I want this to be a celebration of, of Macho Man as the wrestler. But, you know, anything you watch, movies, uh, football, baseball, basketball, where you have your quote-unquote heroes, they, everyone's got demons. Everyone's got secrets. And it's just, it's just a, the world is not black and white. You know, we live in a very gray world, and that, that may sound very jaded, but... Hey, I'm a wrestling fan. Being jaded is part of the territory. <laughs> Especially if you're looking forward to uh, WrestleMania, you're going to be a little bit jaded these days. So, uh, so yeah, that's all I wanted to say about Macho Man real quick. Um, because I do want to just focus on his work and why I like Macho Man, the wrestler. Uh, but, yeah, his promos, you know, back then with the Mega Powers imploding, it really hooked me as a kid. So, when... When Hogan turned on him, I was like, oh snap, Hogan betraying Macho Man, that's big, that's a big deal. Man, I hope Macho Man kicks his butt. And lo and behold, it's this whole, you know, s start of the NWO and wrestling was never the same again. So I thought it was really cool that Kevin Nash came out. What I didn't like is that Kevin Nash won't go down. From the get-go, the dude's countering all my moves. The dude, <laughs> dude's giving me a hard time. And... As much as I love Macho Man, the wrestler, in this game, he is terrible to play as. You know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like, with the exception of his running elbow smash and his diving elbow, you know, his flying elbow, there's not a whole lot of stuff you can do as Macho Man. I mean, his back special is a schoolboy. His front special is that stupid punching, you know, oh yeah combination. And it's stupid. I don't care. Like, you know, I know Macho Man did the punches in, in the matches, but... It's, it's more fun to watch him in the matches than to do him in the game. So I have to kind of concede to the fact that these are his specials. And even right there, I'm going to test to see if he had a corner special. And he doesn't. He has a Samoan drop off the top rope, which is pretty cool. But, you know, there's not a whole lot. And even right here, I go for the pin. I did a Samoan drop. My sp I have my special meter. But since his meter is too far over green, he's going to kick out. Kevin Ash has given me an insanely hard time. And, you know, a few months ago, I tried to do a playthrough of Macho Man, you know, when I was just uploading the playthroughs. And the first two matches were taking forever. They were going they were going as long as this Kevin Ash match will go. And I had to stop because I didn't want to keep playing as Macho Man. I did a playthrough as Hulk Hogan. And Hulk Hogan's another wrestler in this game. That's His, his moveset is just terrible. It's just awful. It just doesn't put you in a position to win. Um, you know, a lot of the grapples and the strong grapples aren't too great of a moves. There's no, there's no polish. There's no shine to it when you're playing the game. In the ring, 
you know, in, in, in actual wrestling, Macho Man was fantastic to watch because it was the whole package. You had his personality, his psychology. You did see his moments of strength and his moments of agility. Um, he, he wasn't busting out power bombs and, and, you know, dragon suplexes, but he, he knew how to tell a story in the ring and he had that old school style and, and, and sprinkled just enough of like you know high flying but high flying for that suited his style that it worked and he you know unfortunately you can't get that comp you know as that you can't get as complex as an actual wrestling match with the you know AKI developed games you only got the grapple system and that's it it'd be kind of cool to see how in wrestling when you have like those quick you know counters where they're like grappling and then the guy go switches to the back of the other guy and then he pulls them under the legs and then they do the whole pinning rotation combination it'd be cool to see if they incorporate that into video games i don't know if they're doing that in the new wwe series you know the 2k series or anything like that but it'd be really cool to see something like that incorporated to wrestling games just so that you can like pace out an actual wrestling match like how it would play out on screen so that's just something I was thinking about as playing as Macho Man but nonetheless I try to keep this run entertaining I definitely try to win with the flying elbow as much as possible but there are a few matches where I get kind of desperate and you know I'm playing as Macho Man he's wearing his NWO black and white colors because I'm I, I like them better when he was with NWO black and white if I had to choose you know in this one he's with the wolf pack and he actually didn't do too much with the wolf pack so and he didn't win the world title as with the wolf pack either so i figured i'd just play in his black and white madness um outfit um so i try to keep it entertaining and but since he's wearing the madness outfit i do have to use a little bit of heel tactics in some matches to win um am i proud of them no but it's something that he a heel would do so I, i'm justifying it that way <laughs> I mean, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't use those tactics if I was playing against a uh, human opponent, but you know, when I'm facing computers that won't go down and get comeback specials like Kevin Nash, it's like, well, sometimes sometimes I got to I got to win the dirty way. Um, but here I go. We both got the, the match has been going on so long that we've both got comeback specials, um, which means our special meters are rising much higher than usual. And you see right there, Kevin Nash went for a running shoulder block. And I was still able to get off my strong grapple. And, and this is, I think, I don't think this was a broken thing. I think this was just an oversight. You know, they fixed this in the next game. But when you have a special in Revenge, like, you can't get touched. Like, you can still get hit with weak, gra with weak moves. But strong moves and you know, recovering attacks or running attacks like that, if you're going for a strong grapple, it won't cancel out the strong grapple. You can still pull it off if you have your special uh, so if you're aware of that you can really take advantage of that and power through if the if the opponent is trying to use a counter attack now here comes Chris Benoit you know and, and again speaking of another wrestler that I admire and then unfortunately his personal life uh, leaves a stain on that and it's hard to it's hard to just dismiss it but at the same time I don't want to take away anything that even Chris Benoit did. And I think Chris Benoit and Macho Man had a match in WCW that was really good, if I remember correctly. I should look that up, but I'll probably check the network later tonight. So the one thing I don't like about the WWE Network, I always talk about in the la in the other videos how much I love the WWE Network, but I really don't like how they're still trying to erase Chris Benoit. Because you, you if you go into the WWE Network, some... some um, some pay-per-views they'll have like the uh, like the little marks on the bottom of the scroll bar if you're looking on the computer not if you're looking on the um, you know when I on your mobile I, I, I believe you know sometimes I watch it on my Kindle fire but if you're if you're watching it on your computer on your desktop the scroll bar on the bottom where you jump throughout them you know whatever it is you're watching whatever pay-per-view you're watching it'll have sections where it sections off when certain matches begin which is really convenient I like that feature, but if Chris Benoit is in the pay-per-view, they won't show you where Chris Benoit's match is. You can kind of just figure it out by seeing where the long gap is that isn't marked. <laughs> 
but it's kind of messed up. It's like, all right, we get it. You're trying to erase Chris Benoit, even though anyone can go on the WWE Network and watch any of his matches and just go to WrestleMania 20. But even if you go to WrestleMania 20, doesn't show you when the match starts that, you know, for the main event with Chris Benoit, Triple H, and Shawn Michaels. So it's kind of messed up. I, gotta, I had to bring that up just because Chris Benoit is coming up here. And I was doing research for a Macho Man video and... I was looking up one of the Starcade, you know, Starcade 95, which is a fantastic pay-per-view, by the way. Uh, it's It was the Starcade 95, like the World Cup of Wrestling. They wanted to do this thing where they every match was WCW wrestlers against New Japan Pro Wrestling wrestlers, which is so cool and very fitting because I'm doing the Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 videos and, you know, I was such a big, you know, mark for... Japanese wrestling back in the day and I'm getting back into it just like how I'm getting back into you know all types of wrestling but I never knew that pay-per-view existed I mean I've knew of Starcade but I haven't seen all of them and Starcade 95 I don't remember at all and Macho Man defended his uh, world title which I'll get into I'll get into his title defenses but you know every wrestler was fighting someone from um, New Japan and I was like wow look at all these people from New Japan you got Tenzan, Chono, and stuff, and Chris Benoit's in it, and Chris Benoit has a match, and but, you know, it's like the first match of the card, but you would never know it if you're just looking, if unless you're actually watching it, but he takes on Jushin Thunder Liger, this Jushin Thunder Liger and Chris Benoit have a match at Starcade 95, and I was losing it, I was like, oh my god, why, how come I never heard of this match, a lot of cool matches, I'll get, I'll get back to that pay-per-view in a bit, you know, I want to, I want to, um, I want to actually try to follow the format I set up for myself. <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I, I, you know, this is going to be a tough episode. This is going to be a tough episode because I have this format where I like to talk about the wrestlers and like the historical context of the game. If you watch my WWF No Mercy videos, I'll talk about like, you know, that year from like November 99 to November 2000 when like No Mercy is being developed. You know, my Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 videos, I try to talk about the history of the guys I'm playing as so that you know if you're not as familiar with these wrestlers because it is you know New Japan all Japan I know a lot of people might not be familiar with those wrestlers so I like to give a little insight to a history also what they were doing at around that time as well how you know how popular they might have been in 1999 and 2000 so here you know I kind of want to do the same thing for the um WCW NW Revenge video you know when I did it for Sting I talked about his US heavyweight runs and I want to talk about Macho Man's World Championship runs, uh, but at the same time, I want to talk about Macho Man. So it's, it's I'm gonna try my best to balance it out. So I'm gonna try to keep myself on task. So, uh, but I am I guess I'm apologizing in advance if I go into tangents about how much I love Macho Man. You know, so that's already two matches. So I gotta kind of hurry it up. I gotta I gotta I gotta get back on task because I just beat I beat Chris Benoit. That's the second match in a row I win with the the punching combination. I just kind I get, I just kind of got to do it. I got to win with it. The first match I didn't really want to win with the punching combination, but it was going on too long, and you know my scores aren't getting that high in this run. I don't care. I don't really care about the score. I just care about winning. I don't want to get to like the second to last match and lose. So here comes British Bulldog, British Bulldog and Macho Man. Um, but yeah, okay. So let's start with. Macho Man coming to WCW. So we all know Macho Man was a big deal in WWF. Uh, he started wrestling in the WWF like in the 80s and you know had a lot of success right away coming into the WWF. He is a one-time Intercontinental Champion and two-time WWF World Champion which is nuts to think about because when I think about Macho Man, I think about him as the Intercontinental Champion. And I think about him winning the World Heavyweight Championships both times, because both times they were pretty memorable, his, his runs as champion. And he only held those titles, you know, the world title twice and the IC title once. But back then it was different. When a guy won a title, they usually had it for a long time. <laughs> and unlike today, uh, but Macho Man, so he's the he's the one-time intercontinental champion he defeated tito santana at a house show uh february 8th 1986 
and his reign would last 414 days. Now only four men in history have held the IC title more than 365 days in one reign. And that's Pedro Morales, you know, represent Puerto Rico, uh, Don Morocco, Randy Savage, and the Honky Tonk Man. So Macho Man is uh, part of an elite group of great IC champions, and he would eventually lose the championship to, everyone say it with me, did you say it? Did I, <laughs> I wanted to make sure you said it before I said it. <laughs> Macho Man would lose the title to Ricky Steamboat, there it is, just wanted to make sure you're all saying it along with me, at R WrestleMania 3. Yeah, I'm testing you guys. You might not think it, but I'm there. I'm testing you guys. I want to see if you're saying this along with me, if you're paying attention. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Ricky Steamboat, WrestleMania 3, the IC title match that everyone knows, everyone loves. And if you don't know this match, if you haven't seen this match, even as much as people talk about it, as much as people have been talking about it recently with Macho Man going into the Hall of Fame, WrestleMania 3, Ricky Steamboat. I mean, this is what the WWE Network is for, ladies and gentlemen. For matches like that. Go watch it. Pa pause this video right now and go watch it. I I'm not going to hold it against you. You know, even if you e don't end up coming back to this video ever again because you just end up getting stuck watching, you know, Ricky Steamboat and Macho Man matches. Because that's not the only one they had. Um, that just was one of their greatest matches on one of the biggest nights of the year. And one of the most historic pay-per-views of all time. Um, and ending one of the most historic Intercontinental Championship runs in all time. It's kind of a big deal, as Ron Burgundy would say. Um, so yeah, that, that that that's just nuts to think. That, I mean, like, at least for me, like I always associated the IC title with only like you know a certain number of guys. You know, Mr. Perfect, Bret Hart, but Macho Man always. And then to he only won it once. And he made such an impact when he held it. And to go out the way he did, oh, beautiful, beautiful match. Go watch it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so then he would go on. He would set his sights on the uh, World Heavyweight title. And you got to remember, he was a bad guy at WrestleMania 3. You know, he was a heel. But his popularity was growing. People were really warming up to him. I I'm guessing it was because of those promos. You know, he's coming out and he's supposed to be, you know making fun of all these heel, the, these good guys and saying how he's going to beat him. He's a tough guy, but his promos are great. They're hilarious. Like, you you can't not help but love them. You know, he's coming out. He's like, ooh, I'm the cream of the crop. You know, he's got, like, the <laughs> the coffee cream. Or he's got, like, the, the, the bear and he punches the bear. Like, just stupid stuff like that. It's like, you can't help but love him. <laughs> Even though he's supposed to be this bad guy. Um... So eventually, people were warming up to him, so roll around to WrestleMania 4. Uh, the title has been vac vacated. You know, Hulk Hogan wins the, the World Heavyweight title from Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3. And um, they go back and forth a little bit throughout the whole year. And actually, Andre the Giant ends up winning the title back from Hogan uh, before WrestleMania 4, but he sells the belt to Ted DiBiase. And then, uh, you know, the, the president, you know, Jack Tunney, you know, the on-screen president. I don't know if he was actually off-screen president. He might have been. But Jack Tunney is like, no, 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 you can't do that. We're going to have a tournament now. I'm going to vacate. I'm going to take the title away from you, DiBiase. You can't just buy the title. I'm going to take it away from you, and we're going to have a tournament at WrestleMania 4. So Macho Man's in this tournament. Hogan and Andre the Giant are in the tournament. Ted DiBiase is in the tournament. And actually, Ho Ho Hogan and Andre the Giant eliminate themselves from the tournament they wrestled to a no dq to a dq uh you know double disqualification and macho man goes on to the finals to face ted dibiase and he beats ted dibiase to become the world heavyweight champion so this is his first title run and this title run would last 371 days uh, again that's more than a year and only seven men in the history of of the WWF slash WWE World Heavyweight Championship has held it more than 365 days in a single run. You guys probably know about this record because a certain um, uh, it was done recently, and a certain wrestler who who we all know and love that left WWE 
touted this fact when he broke the record. So it was Bruno San Martino, Pedro Morales, Bob Backlund, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, John Cena, and CM Punk. Those were the only seven guys to ever hold a title more than 365 days in a single reign. And he basically, Macho Man held the title from WrestleMania 4 to WrestleMania 5 because in WrestleMania 5, the mega powers would implode and, you know, the mega powers no more, you know. <laughs> you, um, I'm going to throw in a lot of Macho Man impressions. <laughs> and each one's going to be different. Uh, depending on how my voice feels throughout the uh, podcast or the podcast, the the recording. I feel like I'm doing a podcast. I feel like I should call up Stone Code and we should do a podcast together. I think that would be good. Uh, we could take the show on the road. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so yeah, and, and that's another interesting note. If you noticed, Pedro Morales and Macho Man are the only two wrestlers to have the title more than 365 days for both belts. So, represent Pedro Morales, man. Puerto Rican, you know, legend of wrestling over there. And Macho Man, isn't it? That's like, that's crazy. So, obviously, right then and there with his, you know, within two years, boom, Hall of Famer already. But it doesn't stop there. You know, Macho Man, after losing the title, he would go back to being heel, uh, bounce around for a little bit as a heel. But then, eventually... Uh, we get a new guy in town, Ric Flair. Ric Flair would show up to the WWF as the real world champion. And um, I, I really wish Ric Flair was in revenge. I talked about this in, in the Sting video, but the reason why Ric Flair is not in revenge is because he there was contract issues and there was a lawsuit going on between him and, Flair, him and Bischoff during the development of this game. So that's most likely why he wasn't included, but... Maybe I'll do like a WCW NWO World Tour uh, video with Ric Flair or maybe I'll create him in like No Mercy or something and do like a championship run in No Mercy with Ric Flair. Because I really, you know, I love Ric Flair. I want to talk a lot about Ric Flair too. But upon Ric Flair's arrival with the whole WWF championship, um, there would be, at the Royal Rumble, the, the title would be vacant um, and Ric Flair would win the WWF title at the Royal Rumble. And then he would start a feud with Macho Man going into WrestleMania 8. That Royal Rumble, by the way, that Ric Flair wins is like my favorite Royal Rumble. As a kid, I loved that Royal Rumble. Uh, and I still do. It's still like one of my favorite. It's still my favorite Royal Rumble of all time. Because there's just so many, there's so many things going on there that's just perfect. And Ric Flair's performance in that Rumble is just great. It's just brilliant. Uh, like you don't see it coming. You don't see it coming that he's going to win, but at the same time, when he does win, it makes so much sense. It's like, well, yeah, of course, he was number three, but, like, the way he did it, like, makes perfect sense. Of course he would win. He's the true champion. Like, it's just, oh, I love it. Uh, the only thing I wouldn't like is that Macho Man and Ric Flair wouldn't main event WrestleMania 8. Their match would come, like, in the middle of the of, of the pay-per-view, which was lame because it, it was the best match of that night. Um, that's another pay-per-view I love and I remember fondly, oh, mainly because of that match. The Macho Man Ric Flair match, oh, was so good. And Ric Flair's promo after he loses the title, the whole, like, he, he hooked the tights promo. Oh, go watch that. Go watch that on YouTube. So much, so much good stuff was happening around that time. And I'm not, and, you know, I talked about this in my sting video like i'm not i'm not even looking at it through like the eyes of a kid like if you, you go back and you watch a lot of that stuff with macho man with rick flair like that was legit great you know promos and matches and everything it wasn't like you're just watching like hulk hogan as a kid like oh he's so awesome and then you go back and you watch like wrestlemania 8 with him against sid justice and you're like really this is the match that main evented wrestlemania but Things change sometimes the way you view them, but the Macho Man stuff, not really. Macho Man, his stuff still holds up, which is why he's one of the best, which is why he's going to the King of the Ring, and which is why I'm going to give an elbow to Stevie Ray right now, and he's not going to stay down. Come on, Stevie Ray, stay down. What's wrong with you? Don't go all Kevin Nash on me. Stevie Ray is another one that's giving me a lot of issues, and I'm trying to definitely put him away with the elbow. I want to put Steve. I want to put Stevie Ray away with the elbow, but he just, he just won't stay down. 
It's tough, man. It's tough in this game to keep guys down, especially if like your flying move isn't a pin. If 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 somehow you could just turn the uh, the elbow drop right into a pin, I think I, w I would win a lot more matches with it. But they just don't stay down a lot of the times. I do win one match, I think, with the pin, with the with the elbow drop. I don't know if it's the Stevie Ray match. I hope it is. <laughs> I'm watching it right now. I did this last night. I played this video, uh, this this game last night, you know, to do this run, and I can't even remember what's the match I win the elbow drop with. Whatever, we'll find out. We'll find out together. <laughs> so yeah, so those were, in a nutshell, in a long, you know, 10 minute nutshell, um, Macho Man's accomplishments as a champion, and you know, in the WWF. Now, after WrestleMania 8. He would kind of bounce around for a little bit. He would drop the title back to Ric Flair. Um, and, you know, not really do much of anything of, of significance after that. Uh, he, would, he would go into to being one of the color commentators. And in 1994, he would leave the WWF for WCW. Now, you know, Ted Turner was giving Eric Bischoff... Uh, a blank checkbook. Do I win it? I think I do win it. Ah, oh, you son of a... He kicks out. You jerk. Stevie Ray, you're such a jerk. <laughs> I never liked Stevie Ray. I loved Harlem Heat. But really, my love of Harlem Heat was just like, I really liked Booker T. And I... <laughs> and I ignored everything Stevie Ray did. <laughs> like, even as a kid, I was like, I'm really digging this Booker T guy. That's Stevie Ray, man. Oh, he's dead weight. You just carry him around, but uh, you know they had good chemistry. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take too much away from Stevie Ray because he, him and you know there wouldn't be a Harlem Heat without him, obviously. But not really a fan. Not really a fan of Stevie Ray. <laughs> uh, Booker T. I love Booker T. I still love, but uh, not Stevie Ray. So I want. I want. I, I think Stevie Ray is the one I beat. With the elbow, the flying elbow. Man, we're already getting into nine minutes of Stevie Ray. Meanwhile, Benoit dropped in like three minutes. Come on. Come on, Stevie Ray. What are you... Who are you? Who's really under that Stevie Ray mask? Is it Booker T? <laughs> um, anyway. So, yeah. So, uh, apparently, we would later find out. Or at least, I don't know. Maybe this always was common knowledge. I never knew about it. But, um... Basically, Macho Man didn't really want to leave WWF. He wanted to stay in the WWF, especially with like Hogan gone. Like now is his opportunity to, to finally become the number one guy and not have having to worry about losing the title back to Flair. I mean, to, to Hogan. Um, but Vince McMahon didn't want to do that. He wanted to keep him in color commentary because he wanted to start building a lot of the new guys. You know, Shawn Michaels, and he wanted to push Bret Hart and this and that. He wanted a lot of the younger talent. And he felt Macho Man was, you know, past his prime, you know, and Macho Man wasn't. Macho Man really wasn't, you know, because his first few years in WCW, he definitely showed that he still had a lot of, a lot left in him. Um, and Lonnie Poffo, who's Macho Man's brother, who, you know, was spent a short time in the WWE as the genius, if, you know, that's how most people remember him. On um, he has a great podcast with uh, Chris Jericho, or I should say, he's a guest on Chris Jericho's podcast. And oh, so here's where I do dirty tactics. It's like Stevie Ray won't go down. I'm not looking to make this like a 60 minute Broadway. <laughs> so I baseball slide kick him to keep him out of the ring. That's an old cheesy tactic I used to use as a kid. And uh, and then I taunt on the turnbuckle. <laughs> Because when you win a count out, your character doesn't taunt. So I taunt right away after I do it. And you don't get a replay, so you can't see it. Uh, <laughs> again, but... Um, yeah, I had to do what needed to be done. You know, this, that match was going on too long for its own good. But you know who that, who that made upset? That made Booker T upset. <laughs> Here comes Booker T. Booker T is like, oh, I'm going to get you, sucker. You, you, dirt, you, you did my brother dirty. Oh, man. Booker T. Now I'm really scared because it's like, oh, Booker T is actually really tough in this game. Because he's another one, man. He just won't go down. He's kind of like uh, he's kind of like Goldberg in this game. Like, you just can't keep him down for some reason. Every time I face Booker T, you know, I lose a lot of the times. You know, you know if, if we could do this off the record, you know, don't tell anyone. But sometimes when I've recorded those WCW playthrough, playthroughs, I would lose my matches. 
uh, like halfway, and a lot of the times it was either to Goldberg or Booker T or Alex Wright. Oddly enough, when I was doing the cruiserweight stuff, I would lose to Alex Wright a lot. That pissed me off. Not because it was I was losing to Alex Wright because you know I was a fan of Alex Wright and I wish he had a better WCW career. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's get back to Macho Man. So he leaves WWF. Ted Turner gives him a nice big juicy contract. And now him and Hogan are in WCW. Oh, that's what I was saying. In, <laughs> in Lonnie Poffel's podcast with Chris Jericho, or his interview with, on Chris Jericho's podcast, which I highly recommend. I highly recommend you, you listening to Chris Jericho's podcast. It's really fun. Um, I listen to him. I listen to Taz. I listen to Stone Cold. I listen to Colt Cabana. Who else do I listen to? Jim Ross. All great podcasts. But Lonnie Poffel, shortly after Macho Man was announced, to be in the Hall of Fame. He has a great podcast where he talks about that decision, how it came to be for Macho Man to get into the Hall of Fame and why it took a long time. Uh, he talks about how his brother wanted to, when it came time for him to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, he didn't want to be inducted on his own. He wanted to induct the Poffo family, basically because he wanted to get his father into the Hall of Fame. He really respected his father and loved his father a lot and felt like his father did a lot for him um, growing up as a family to help support the family being a wrestler. And there was an incident at, like, there was supposed to be, like, a legendary battle royal at, like, the Garden and all, like, the greats from, you know, before, you know, when, from, from Macho Man's dad's era was going to be involved. You know, everyone was going to be in there. I think Bruno was going to be in there and stuff like that. And Macho Man wanted to get his dad into the battle royal you know his dad really wanted to be involved because he wanted to see all the guys again and work with the guys again and it was at the garden and macho man was you know big stuff at the time you know in wwe so he felt like he had a lot of pull and he goes to try to get him into the battle royal and they they say no they say like no they don't want uh macho man's dad in the battle royal and that really that really hurt macho man a lot and he felt like he let his dad down. And this is what Lonnie says. You know, he felt like he, he let his dad down. And that always stuck with him. So flash forward many years later when, you know, his dad has passed and Macho Man has had the career he's had. Um, and they want to induct him into the Hall of Fame. He's like, I don't want to go in unless dad goes in pretty much. And he was, he was defiant and he was adamant about it. So flash forward again macho man passes you know he has the car accident he dies tragically and now Lonnie Poffel is now riddled with the guilt of his brother um, not getting his dad into the Hall of Fame and he feels that now he has to honor his brother's wishes to honor his dad being in the Hall of Fame and the whole Poffel family and he basically rejects the Hall of Fame offer once again to bring in Macho Man after he's passed because he, he said that Macho Man wanted the Poffo family to go in together. That's what Randy wanted, so that's what I want. Now, Lonnie has this epiphany when he turns 59, uh, which is like a couple of years after Macho Man's death, because now he's like, wait a minute, I'm the older brother now. You know, now I can finally call the shots. I don't have to follow the orders of my brother anymore because I'm the older brother. He's passed. I've outlived him. So now I can make the decisions of what's right going forward for our family. And he has this like sudden realization that his brother should be in the Hall of Fame because it's the right thing to do for the fans. It's the right thing to do for the impact that Macho Man has had. Uh, in 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 wrestling in the WWE, and he's the last surviving Poffo, so he gets to make the call. And he told his mom about it. And his first, his mom wasn't too keen on the idea, but eventually she decided to go along with it as well. And and Lonnie just had to wait till the next year would roll around, and that he would get the call. And and this time he would finally say yes to Macho Man being go, going into the Hall of Fame. So it's it's a, it's, it's kind of a beautiful story, honestly. Um, and again, you know, there's always so many sides to a story, but at least the, the version that Lonnie gives is very beautiful. And 
you know, um, yeah, it's just it's just very heartfelt. So th- that's how he he gets in. Um, but also in the podcast, he shares, you know, a lot of the things that went wrong with the relationship with Macho Man and Vince McMahon after he left the WWF. Uh, apparently, the one he really wanted to push an angle with him and Shawn Michaels working a feud for a few years, leading up to Shawn Michaels and Macho Man. Uh, you know him kind of passing the torch to Shawn Michaels at Wrestlemania doing like a career versus career match and um, You know Shawn Michaels was being managed by sensational Sherry He was kind of the new age macho man in a way, you know macho man was this very flamboyant yet, you know Macho if you will, you know um guy who, who who wrestled in pink tights and had these like golden robes and he had a crown and kind of the opposite of what you think maybe a macho man would be but he still embodied that persona so it was it was um contradictory like only a man who was that tough and that comfortable in himself could wear outfits like that flash forward so many years later now you have Shawn Michaels you know the heartbreak kid he's coming down he's got the leather he's got the hearts on him and you know this very effeminate guy but yet he's tough and he is a macho man he in a way he's he's very comfortable in who he is as a man and and macho man saw a lot of potential in that feud not only because of their characters and the dynamic between their characters but also um you know he saw in Shawn Michaels greatness like you know everyone did and he wanted to work with him and apparently Vince wasn't too keen on that idea he wanted to push just Shawn Michaels and Brett so since there was Macho Man felt there was nothing left for him he decided well you know what fine I will go to WCW and you know Lonnie talks about that in the podcast so I really I really recommend you listening to to Lonnie's podcast with Chris Jericho you can get it on podcast one uh, you know or you can subscribe to his podcast on iTunes Uh, but it's really informative about uh, Macho Man's last days in WCW and there's a lot of other things that went into it but you know basically now Macho Man's in WCW and now he's even though he's billed as one of the top stars in WCW he still has to kind of play second fiddle to uh, Hulk Hogan, you know. I'm not number, I'm not number two, number three. Yeah. <laughs> Go watch that promo; it's so good. Uh, when the mega powers implode, um, Macho Man was so angry at, at 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 Hogan. He really believed Hogan was trying to take Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> he really did. Like that's not even a joke. Like he really did. Like when Hulk Hogan was carrying her back there, he wasn't supposed to be carrying her back there. And Macho Man was just pissed about it. He was like, I'm not number, I'm not number two, I'm number three with you, Hogan. <laughs> um, so, he, so yeah, so now he's in WCW, and right away he starts feuding with Ric Flair again because you know Macho Man and Ric Flair is money, okay? And, you know they did the whole Ric Flair Hogan thing when Hogan came in, but those matches aren't good. Let's be honest. Uh, you know Flair did his best to work with Hogan. But Hogan just doesn't, his style just wasn't the same as Flair. He couldn't compete on the level as Flair did. But Macho Man and Flair, they could go and watch any of those early, you know, 1995 uh, Macho Man Flair matches. Oh, they're so good. You know, 94, 95, I should say. Uh, But yeah, so Macho Man's in there. And then, you know, Hogan's been the champion for a while. So the Giants shows up, you know, the big show. He shows up. And he beats Hogan for the title, but it's kind of like, you know, weird the way he beats him. Apparently, it was like a no DQ match. And at first, they were like, yeah, we're going to go with this. And then the Giant wins. And then like, oh, no, we're going to reverse this decision because that wasn't right. And so they stripped the Giant of the title. And then they put the title up for grabs at the uh, World War III pay-per-view where they do the first ever 60-man battle royal uh, spread across three rings. And I loved that pay-per-view. I loved all the World War Threes. Um, just the concept of these three rings that were there the whole night. And guys had to work around that. You know, every match, you know, was in a different ring. And um, and then eventually you have the 60-man battle royal. And everyone was coming out from, like, you know, you know Kevin Nash to, like, El Dandy. Like, everyone <laughs> everyone was in that match. I loved the, the World War Threes. 
I kind of wish that was something that WWF stole from WCW, or that's something that could have made it into this game. But um, alas, no World War Three. That's that's what I want to see. I want to see the day where we could do a video game, a wrestling video game, where you can have 60 wrestlers in the ring at one time. That's when you know we've really come far <laughs> in technology. We're able to do a wrestling game. And it doesn't have to be look like, you know, like how like the 2K games look. Like even if it was a wrestling game that looked like Revenge, but you had 60 wrestlers in three different rings at the same time. Maybe it's like an MMO, like an MMO wrestling game. <laughs> it's like an always online wrestling game. And you could hold a pay-per-view where you do the World War III Battle Royal. Ah, oh, that'd be beautiful. I'd buy it. I'd pay for that. <laughs> he got my money. <laughs> Imaginary game. Anyway, um, so yeah, he he enters the World War Three, and he wins. So Macho Man, Macho Man actually wins the first World War Three sixty man battle royal, and Hogan makes a big stink about it at the end because Hogan was pulled under the ropes, brother. But since they're cool, they're cool now. Um, Hogan's gonna let it slide, but he's gonna show him the tape on Nitro the next night, and they're gonna talk about it. They're gonna hash it out. <laughs> and Macho Man's like, well, I'm the champion. Who cares? Whatever. I'm getting the belt. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's such a weird promo, but Macho Man handles it with class. Um, so he, his first title reign wouldn't last long because he would only hold the title for 31 days before losing it uh, back to Flair, losing it to Flair, I should say, uh, at Starcade '95. Now this was the, you know, what I talked about earlier. In the, at the episode, this was the World Cup, you know, the Wrestling World Cup is what they built it as because it was a lot of New Japan talent, and every match was a guy from New Japan taking on a guy from WCW. So, so Team WCW had to unite, um, and Savage actually took on. He actually fought twice on that pay-per-view, as did Sting. Uh, Savage took on Hiroyoshi Tenzan, who is a be better gamer, uh, let's play alumni. Go watch my Masahiro Chono Let's Play videos and you'll see me tag teaming with Hiroyoshi Tenzan. And uh, he would beat him in that match. Um, you, you, you know, you had Liger versus Benoit. Lex Luger took on Masa Chono. Uh, Eddie Guerrero took on Shinjiro Otani, which is a fantastic match. You know, Otani, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion. Um, you know, several time IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion. Uh, Sting, he took on Kenzuki Sasaki, uh, who was also known as the Power Warrior. Um, and Koji Kanemoto was there. He took on Alex Wright. Um, I think the, the only weak match of the, of the card was actually Masasoto against Johnny B. Bad. That's just because, you know, Mark Merrill, Johnny B. Bad, you know, whatever. <laughs> they, they can't all be winners. <laughs> but, um,. There was a triangle match between Flair, Sting, and Luger to see who would face Macho Man at the end of the night for the world title. So Flair won that match, and then he would win the match against Savage. So this continued the the the, the feud between Flair and Savage for when Savage came into the WCW. But you know now you have the world title picture. In, you know, involved or you have the world title involved in the picture, which is how it should be, you know. And that's, I mean, that's telling from when Macho Man was the champion and when Hogan was the champion. When Macho Man was the champion, even as briefly as he held it in WCW, his matches with Flair, ex, you know, outclassed Hogan's matches with Flair. Um, but Hogan had the longer run, so I don't know. I just, I just. I just feel like when Macho Man got to WCW, he, he had great momentum coming in. You know, he had the feud with Flair. They went back and forth for the title. He'd get the title back from Flair on an episode of Nitro, um, you know, a few weeks later. And then he would hold it for like 20 more days before losing it back to Flair at Super Brawl 6 in a steel cage match. So he had all this momentum. And you think this is how it's going to be for a while, you know, like, you know, Flair and Macho Man always in like the title picture back and forth. You know, sprinkle Hogan a little bit, sprinkle Sting a little bit. But that's not the case. After, you know, after he dropped the title to the second time to Flair, you know, a few months later, you have Bash of the Beach 96. 
and then the NWO and then WCW became all about the NWO and that's when things started getting really screwy with the, the world title I mean Hogan had that initial long run as the champion you know after winning the title I believe um, the Giant was the champion I believe the Giant beat Ric Flair and then Hogan would beat the Giant and then Hogan would hold it for a very long time uh, and then you'd have the Sting you know Sting would have that whole feud with Hogan where Sting would eventually take the title from Hogan so Macho Man now has just been betrayed by Hogan the Mega Powers imploded twice <laughs> and uh, so for a few months he's getting beat up by the NWO like everyone else and then all of a sudden you know February uh, 1997 Super Bowl 7 rolls around and Macho Man's NWO and I did not care for that <laughs> I remember as a kid when Macho Man joined I was like wait a minute you got you got betrayed by Hogan that night you know you shouldn't be part of the NWO what's going on here and I didn't think too much about it as a kid I just remember I did not agree with it I was like no I like the Macho Man not being in the NWO now he's in the NWO that's not cool and you know looking back at it all you could you could you could see how obvious you know the NWO wasn't gonna last you know it was a hot idea for a moment but there was just too much ego too much politicking and you know as a kid you don't realize it but when you get older and you read the books and you hear the stories and you see all that go down but I think most importantly the realization I had going on later on is that man Macho Man got screwed out of that deal because here he is he comes into the WCW right so my Hogan's already been there for a little bit now Macho Man comes in now Macho Man gets the world title Macho Man's getting hot again getting hotter than Hogan in a way because his matches with Ric Flair actually are great and now Hogan does his next hot thing right so Hogan has all the attention on him again and instead of building up guys to fight against it's just all about making the NWO the hot thing but no one can get hotter than Hogan so what do they do is they start taking the top baby faces and just make make them NWO guys and that's what they did with Macho Man and then all of a sudden for like a whole year Macho Man is out of the world title picture because he's just you know a a NWO guy he's just another NWO guy and another reason why I didn't like Macho Man being part of the NWO is because the outfits were gone like think about it like I and like 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 bear with me for a moment but the whole Macho Man persona was this larger than life character he stood out from the crowd if you looked at a lineup of wrestlers who were all supposed to be unique and different individuals and have all these crazy gimmicks Macho Man still stood out from that he still stood out from this colorful cast of characters you know of different wrestlers and you put them in the NWO so you slap on black pants and a black and white t-shirt now he looks like every other guy you know there's nothing special about him being in the NWO yeah it's Macho Man but it's not the same Macho Man anymore he's just he's just another guy wearing a uniform and that's another reason why I didn't like that the only saving grace about Macho Man being in the NWO in the beginning was his feud with Diamond Dallas Page. Oh man, like right after he would join the NWO, all of a sudden Macho Man and DDP had this feud that lasted like the whole year of 97 almost. And it's so good. I, I think out of anything that I remember the most about the WCW run that Macho Man had, and that I would put on the same level as the stuff he did in WWF would be the DDP feud. Those matches, those pay-per-views, I look forward to those matches on every pay-per-view as much as I look forward to like the Rey Mysterio, like Cruiserweight matches and, and all that stuff. You know, those were the highlights. Go, you know, again, WWE Network. If you've never seen Macho Man in WCW or you're just not familiar with his work in WCW, just watch his 1997 pay-per-view matches with DDP that feud was so good it put DDP over DDP skyrocketed to the moon after that feud 
DDP was hot stuff for that feud, and Macho Man and him brought it. Uh, and Raven got involved a little bit, and they had like this great three-way dance. Oh, that was so good. Raven, Macho Man, and, and DDP. You know, and it's something that, I mean, DDP was, was older. He got into wrestling later than a lot of guys do, but he was still relatively like a new face. And Raven was a younger guy. And you think back, or, you know, at least me now, I, I know of this now. I know of Macho Man's, you know, wanting to do a, a, a run with Shawn Michaels now. I only recently learned of it. But I'm looking back at his stuff in WCW, and I'm looking at that DDP P feud, and Macho Man puts him over. Macho Man really makes DDP look like a million bucks. Not saying like DDP needed someone to make him look like a million bucks, because DDP was a stud. He was so good. Um, I mean, I think DDP is a great wrestler, but he really helped put over the Diamond Dallas Page character and really bring DDP in the eyes of the you know wrestling fan to that main event status you know where Macho Man was um, you know and and I love that I, I love that pay I love that run and and that really for me was the highlight of Macho Man's career along with the Ric Flair matches uh, because you know that was just a recreation of like their WrestleMania 8 feud um, that was the highlight of Macho Man in WCW so I, I highly recommend any of those DDP Macho Man matches um, if you have the WWE Network or you know maybe they have them on YouTube or Daily Motion or whatever however you can get your hands on those matches those matches were so good and people don't talk about that feud a lot I notice people don't ever talk about the Macho Man DDP feud I feel like I'm the only one who ever mentions it when we talk about like Macho Man runs like everyone always talks about you know Ricky Steamboat and Hogan and Ultimate Warrior and I'm like what about that feud he had with DDP and WCW that feud was great so yeah go watch that I highly recommend that I wish DDP was in this run because that would have been great that would have been great to talk about that feud if DDP showed up in this championship run Bret Hart's here so that's cool I just you know I, I thought that was funny because like I beat Stevie Ray and then Booker T came out and then I beat Excuse me. And then I beat Jim Neidhart, and now Bret Hart comes out. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, like the tag teams are coming out. Um, but anyway, and Bret Hart, and when Bret Hart would come to the WWE, WCW, him and Macho Man had a brief feud, and they had some good matches. And I would have liked to see more Macho Man Bret Hart stuff, because I think that would have been great. But they both were in you know positions they wanted to be in WCW when they started feuding with each other so they they put on good matches but it wasn't what what it what it could have been especially on Bret Hart's side Bret Hart was very unhappy and um you know he's talked about it like he he always did try to go out there and deliver great matches but you know a match can only be so good on its own sometimes what really helps elevate the match is the context of the match you know like Daniel Bryan like Think of Daniel Bryan, like WrestleMania 30. You know, WrestleMania 30, his match against Triple H was the best match on the card. But but when you also think about Daniel Bryan, you're going to think about that triple threat match with him, Randy Orton, and Batista. Now, that was a good match. It wasn't a great match. It wasn't like, oh, blew me out the water, the best triple threat match I've ever seen. Um, but it's still memorable because of the context, because this was the culmination of Daniel Bryan's, you know, journey from SummerSlam, from having the belt taken away from him from Randy Orton, from not being involved in the Royal Rumble, and now he goes, he wins the title. So you remember that match. You remember that triple threat match because of the context. You know, some matches that are great, you know, they, there's no context surrounding them. They're just great one-on-one -on -one matches. And I think that's why those matches tend to get forgotten because, you know, there was just no either no context surrounding it or the context surrounding it was very bad. <laughs> You know, they're actually Uprocks, uh, Uprocks.com, they have a wrestling section called, like, With Spandex, and they did a, like, top, you know, Sting matches in, you know, in WCW during his, like, whole Crow gimmick. And there's a few of the matches are like that. A few of the matches are really good, but the context surrounding them are really bad. <laughs> 
so you forget how good those matches were because there always there was always some stupid like NWO stuff going on. Case in point, coming up, where, you know, let's just let's just jump right into it since we're talking about Sting. You know, I did Sting the last video. Now I'm doing Macho Man. So, you know, Macho Man's with the NWO. Hogan's having this feud with Sting. So Hogan finally loses the belt to Sting, and then the title's taken away from Sting because it didn't count. Because Bret Hart, you know, whatever. And then Sting and Hogan have the rematch. And then Sting wins, wins it again. So now Macho Man is like, okay, you know what, Hogan? You're not the man. You're not the man for the job, Hogan. <laughs> there it is. That's my, that's my impression. Um, so he starts challenging Hogan's power as leader of the NWO. And Ma Macho Man thinks he's the one that should be challenging Sting for the world title. So him and Hogan actually have a match uh, where they have like a steel cage match to decide who's going to face Sting and it ends up not being a finish. Like, you know, Macho Man beats up Hogan but he like storms out of the cage and um, Macho Man eventually gets his shot against Sting for the, the, uh, the world title and he beats him. And this is, um, what is this? This is... Spring Stampede. This is Spring Stampede 98. So this is during the time that WCW NWO Revenge is getting developed. Uh, April 19th, 1998. You know, WCW NWO Revenge would be released in October of 98. And Randy Savage defeats Sting in a no DQ match thanks to the help of Kevin Nash. So that was a pretty decent match. It was an okay match. Sting against Randy Savage. I mean, I'd enjo I enjoyed it because it was like, oh, this is better than watching Hogan and Sting. But um, the next night on Nitro, Hogan's all like, just give the title to me now. <laughs> and Macho Man's like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so they have a match. And, you know, Hogan thinks the title should belong to him. Like, whoever in the NWO, if anyone in the NWO is going to have a title, it's going to be Hogan. Because, you know, that's probably how it really was backstage. And, um, Macho Man loses the title the next night. And it's it's just, like, stuff like that. Like, here's, here's the opportunity to really draw out an angle where Macho Man's now the champion. I mean, this is, this is the Mega Powers all over again. Just the roles reversed and different situation, and you know what what would have happened if a top NWO guy that wasn't Hogan had the title. I think I think the NWO angle wouldn't have burned out as much. You know, I mean there were a lot of other factors, but if Macho Man was allowed to have a run as the champion and Hogan's um, authority was questioned as leader of the nwo then you move away from like oh this is hogan's thing to the nwo itself being an entity and only like the top dog can lead the wolf you know the wolf pack uh which is kind of fitting because that's exactly what would happen because nash sided with with macho man and hogan you know kind of removed macho man from the group by having bret hart help him to beat macho man for the title now Macho Man and Nash and Conan split from the NWO and they formed the NWO Wolfpack. Um, but you think about that term. Think about that term like a wolf pack. So a pack of wolf, right? wolves, right? So the, there's the leader of the pack. And if he gets injured or if he gets hurt, uh, another wolf, uh, you know, another wolf can challenge him for being leader of the pack. And, and fight him and and, and 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 beat him in that match. Like this actually happens. Like I saw a National Geographic about it. Like like either kill the wolf or hurt the wolf so bad. Like now the wolf is no longer the leader of the pack, and he just becomes just one of the other wolves, or or he, he either ends up falling to the end of the pack or completely removed. And they could have done that with Hogan and Macho Man and. This could have set up maybe Hogan's return as a good guy. Like, look at the monster I created. This entity, this NWO, is just a bunch of savages, uh, literally, because now Randy Savage is leading it. And it could have, I don't know, I felt like they could have gone in a whole different direction, but there were so many issues with the NWO and backstage politics, so we, we were never going to get that scenario um, I mean, I always would have preferred Macho Man as a champion because at least we know his matches are going to be a lot more entertaining than the Hogan matches. And again, this is saying it with the lens of the older wrestling fan, 
you know the the smart mark if you will uh, but let, let's face it like like Hogan I'm not I'm not saying it's a knock Hogan I loved Hogan as a kid and I'm not gonna take away my enjoyment of Hogan as a kid because I simply got older and my my taste for what wrestling is or what wrestling should be uh, mat matured beyond what Hogan would give me at the same time there was a lot of good matches that Hogan was involved in um, but he just wasn't that wrestler that you knew would, was going to put on a clinic every time he went out there. It all really had to depend on who he was working with. Um, and even later on in age, he still showed signs of being a great performer in the ring as long as he had another great performer with him. I mean, you look at his matches with The Rock, with Shawn Michaels, with Kurt Angle. I mean, he's still able to deliver good matches. It's just that and that whole NWO scene was so toxic and I think it was very reflective of Hogan's body of work in, in the ring because while there was a lot of hype and build up with Hulk Hogan being this leader of the NWO, when it came time to those pay-per-views, uh, those matches that he would have with like Piper or whoever or Luger or whoever, they always fell short. And even I, you know, I even noticed this back then when I was watching it live, you know, when I was watching the NWO rise and fall in front of me, I would get excited for the possibility of these pay-per-views where, where Hogan, Hogan's headlining it. And then it's just like, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see Hogan and Dennis Rodman taking on DDP and Carmelo. Like, this is really what they're building it up to. Like, this is what it's been all about. I don't know. Um... So yeah, that's just something I was thinking about when I was doing this run. Like, man, what would have happened if Macho Man was allowed to hold on to that world title more than a day? Um, but apparently, they it didn't matter because they would do it again. <laughs> so that's so that's three titles right now. That's three um, world championship titles that that Macho Man has held. You know, he won it at. Um, World War Three, he would lose it to Flair, win it back from Flair, uh, then lose it again, and then he would win it from Sting, and now he loses it to Hogan. So we flash forward to um, like June of '98, you know, a few months after forming the Wolf Pack. Hogan, uh, Macho Man gets injured, so he, so he's off, um, you know, WCW TV for a while. So you don't see him pretty much after, um, what's the Great American Bash? You know, he has a match with Roddy Piper, and then bam, we don't see him for a while. And during this time, you got the rise of Bill Goldberg. Goldberg beats Hogan, so he gets the title off of Hogan. And then, um, you know, Goldberg's having this run as champion, and then Kevin Nash beats Hogan. And right around this time when Nash beats Hogan, um, that's when that's when Macho Man returned. He returned the night that the Four Horsemen reformed, you know, when Ric Flair came back to the company. And he actually helped uh, the Four Horsemen attack the Giant and the rest of the NWO. So he wasn't aligned with the NWO anymore. Um, and Nash would... Uh, do the whole uh, finger poke of doom with Hulk Hogan. So yeah, that would happen. <laughs> and if you don't know what that is, go look that up. But basically, when Nash beat Goldberg for the title, the next night on, on Nitro, um, you know, again, Hogan wanted the belt. But this is when like Nash was head of the Wolf Pack, so him and Hogan were feuding. But Hogan wanted the belt, and they have a match, and Nash lays down after Hogan pokes him, literally pokes him, and Hulk Hogan's the champion again. Finger poke of doom, ladies and gentlemen. And a lot of people say that was one of the deciding factors in the Attitude Era of like the Monday Night Wars. Uh, I think there was a lot more. It wasn't just that singular moment, but that singular moment was just one of the one of many stupid decisions they made with the world, you know, title pitcher. And speaking of the devil, here comes Hulk Hogan <laughs> with that world title. And I'm about to take it away from Randy Savage. I made it this far, 
it was it's definitely been a struggle man if you've been watching the matches while i've been talking about you know my thoughts of macho man and wcw and his history and stuff like that it hasn't been easy it's been very hard it's been a lot of hard fought battles especially with a uh, move set like macho man's in this game but um yeah so th you know you know you have that happen and once again hogan's the champion doesn't last long this time it's not like how it was when uh he had the title that first time but you know rick flair would beat him for the title then ddp would get the title then sting technically got the title but then ddp got it then nash would get it again so nash is the champion and um you know macho man's back now he's back in wcw and now he starts feuding with nash and they they have a tag team match on uh what's the pay-per-view they had in July of 99, um, Macho Man and Sid Vicious team up against Sting and Nash. You know, Sting and Nash are the Wolf Pack. Macho Man no longer in the Wolf Pack. He's got no allegiances now. He's not aligned with any NWO of any form. And he. Um, they have this tag team match where the title's on the line. So whoever, pin, whoever makes the pinfall becomes the champion. And Macho Man actually just ends up pinning Nash, which is which is weird because it's like they should just had a one-on-one -on -one match where Macho Man pinned them, but whatever. So now Macho Man's the champion again. Like, all right, Macho Man's the champion, the lone wolf. He's back. He's not aligned with NWO White. He's not aligned with NWO Red. He is just madness, and he's the champion again. So next night on Nitro, what happens? That's right, you guessed it. Hulk Hogan comes and he beats him for the title. So. <laughs> He said, did you hear how dejected I got when I had to say that statement? Uh, WCW. How much I love the... But at the same time, there was just so many things about it that even while watching it, it, it didn't take too... It wasn't too hard for WCW to, you know, ruin all the good they had built. You wanted to be excited for WCW. You wanted to be excited for the stuff that was going on. But they just did so many things that just, like, got you really dejected. And it's funny that we're doing the whole kind of, like, revisiting of the Attitude Era versus, you know, the NWO Era. You know, the whole Monday Night Wars. I feel like WrestleMania 31 is preying a lot on that nostalgia. Um, you know, especially with Sting and Triple H, and I talked about this in my last video, but it was something I was thinking about when I was doing this video. There was a lot of good going on in WCW, there was a lot of good wrestling, a lot of good wrestlers that weren't being utilized well, okay? A lot of good talent in the mid-card and the undercard. Uh, main eventers who should have been main eventers weren't getting their spot, and a lot of guys who were main eventing probably didn't deserve their spot. Um, or they just, you know, kept winning and doing things in, in ways that just were like, you did not care for it. You know, when, when Hogan won that second time, you know, from, from Nash, I mean, from, um, from Savage, uh, basically Kevin Nash runs in and attacks Savage and, and they'll be all back together. And it's like, wait a minute. Didn't Nash help Macho Man, like, not even a year ago, beat Hogan for the title? And now all of a sudden we're going right back to it. We're going back to, you know, this whole Wolfpack thing is gone now. Now it's like Hogan and Nash are back together. I don't know. It was weird. Um, but I'm playing this. I'm playing this last night. And I'm playing Macho Man and Hogan. And just an eternal conflict of two superstars one who is a fantastic in-ring talent who has the promo ability who has the character to be a number one star but just another superstar that also has a lot of great things about him uh maybe not as great in the ring worker as as the other um but refusing to relinquish his position as a top guy even in the moments where the number two guy is showing signs that he's the number one guy now. You know, now he's the leader of the pack. Just whatever has happened has happened to make it so that now the fans all want to see number two be number one. You know, they don't want to see him be number three. 
Um, you know, so, and I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about, like, all the stupid WCW title changes that happened, all the world title changes, all the, you know, bad plot lines with the NWO, you know, how quickly they took a good idea and made it bad, and I'm thinking, I'm like, that's what's happening now in the WWE. You know, it's, it's kind of ironic that they're revisiting this whole... NWO, WCW versus WWF thing, and WWF won the Monday Night Wars. But you look at what WWF is doing, or WWE is doing, and they're kind of regressing. You know, they're pushing guys that shouldn't be pushed. They're going against what the fans want. They're revisiting storylines and plot devices that have been used over and over again that you see coming a mile away. And you, you just don't care for it anymore. And you see that. And that's the predicament they're in. And I, I feel like they're at a big crossroads right now. Because with the whole Daniel Bryan issue. With the whole Brock Lesnar issue. With, with, with all these things. You know, all the Dolph Ziggler. And, you know, Cesaro. And Bray Wyatt. And all these things. It's like... They're, they're at a big crossroads because for a company that has evolved so much, now to take a step back, if they continue taking a step back, it's going to be really hard for them to take another step forward. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, if you take too many step back, sometimes you just can't, you just can't go forward anymore because you, you've fallen backwards off the edge. And that's what kind of happened with WCW. So, I don't want to end this on a downer. I'm trying not to end this on a downer, but that's what I was thinking when I was playing, when I was wrapping up my Macho Man playthrough and thinking about revisiting his career, revisiting the stuff he did in WWF and WCW and thinking about like, wow, we, as much as so much has changed in wrestling, uh, at least with the WWE, a lot has stayed the same. And did they really learn anything from that Monday Night War? Because um, I feel like they're struggling with a lot of the issues creatively that hurt WCW um, so yeah that's just something to think about you know as we watch Macho Man being the WCW World Heavyweight Champion uh, he'll probably hold it much longer than one day <laughs> which will be longer than two of his runs um, as WCW World Heavyweight Champion um, but, you know, go watch those WCW matches with Ric Flair that Macho Man did. Go watch his early stuff in WWF. Go watch his DDP feud. All that stuff is great. I hope you enjoyed this video. A lot of heavy stuff to think about in this video. Um, so it's a little different, but at the same time, you know, I did squeeze in a lot of history, historical context stuff that I really love doing for these videos. I hope you enjoy it. Please leave a like, leave a comment. Let me know who you want to see next. I'm kind of struggling with who I'm going to do next in the title runs. Just because there's so many guys I want to play with. So feel free to shoot me a comment on that. Subscribe so you know when my next video comes out. And yeah, Macho Man. Let's do a Ooh yeah. Can you dig it? Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Take it easy, guys. See you next time.